Ladies and gentlemen, if you can please find your seats, the program will begin in two minutes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We'd like to get the program underway, so if you can find your seats, please. Thank you. Well, good morning. I hope all of you enjoyed your chance to experience some of New Orleans' fantastic food and drink in, pun intended, some of the colorful nightlife. If not, no worries. You'll have another chance tonight. Thank you to all the people who contributed to the Statement of Principles. You can see their comments on your biennial app right on your smartphone, on the monitors on the third floor, and on our biennial website. You can still add your commentary at the registration desk on the third floor, right next to the Statement of Principles, which we hope you'll sign when you are there. I would like to call upon one of JCC Association's board members, Merrill Ansman, to introduce this year's Esther Leia Ritz Award recipients. Merrill chaired this program, which is another important step in assuring the future of the JCC movement. The Esther Leia Ritz Emerging JCC Leaders are nominated by their JCCs to participate in this year-round year leadership training program. Merrill. Thank you, Gary. It all begins here at the Biennial with six intensive sessions on the many aspects of leadership. 
Participants will then take on a new responsibility back in their home communities that benefits their JCC. I'm so pleased to present these awards to a truly impressive group of emerging leaders. We have 62 emerging leaders representing 40 different JCCs from around, the North, from around North America. Esther Leah Ritz would be very proud to see that this legacy continues in her memory. Please join me in recognizing our awardees. I ask that you please hold your applause until we've shared the full list with you. And I have to tell you, we've had a great couple days together, and it's really a pretty awesome group. And I, I'm just very pleased to be able to present them to you now. So I know their names are going to go on the screen. There we go. Now hold your applause, please. <laughs> From the Addison Penzac JCC of Silicon Valley in Los Gatos, California, Millie Sprints. From the Adolph and Rose Levi's JCC in Boca Raton, Florida, Marvin Finkelstein and April Levy. From the Betty and Milton Katz JCC in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, Stephen Greenberg. From the Betty and Milton Katz JCC in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, Jeffrey Resnick and Jen Shoulder. From the Charleston JCC in Charleston, North Carolina, Mindy Hawkins. From the David Posnack JCC in Davie, Florida, Cindy Schneider. From the Evelyn Rubenstein JCC in Houston, Texas, Elizabeth Cohen and Kenneth Katz. Please stand, I'm sorry, I should be. From the Jew Jewish Community Alliance in Jacksonville, Florida, Adam Frisch. From the JCC of Austin in Austin, Texas, Jill May. From the JCC of Central New Jersey in Scotch Plains, New Jersey, Stuart Fuxman and Elizabeth Isser from the JCC of Greater Ann Arbor in, Ar in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Clara Silver, from the JCC of Greater Baltimore in Baltimore, Maryland, Randy Bergenthal. Now I know how they feel at the Academy Awards with all these names. <laughs> from the JCC of Greater Baltimore in Baltimore, Maryland, Carol Noel, from the JCC of Greater Columbus in Columbus, Ohio, Karen Shore Meyer, from the JCC of Greater Kansas City in Overland Park, Kansas, Mark Bain. From the JCC of Greater St. Paul area in St. Paul, Minnesota, David Koretsky. From the JCC of Greater St. Paul area in St. Paul, Minnesota, Jeffrey Tain. From the JCC of Greater Vancouver in Vancouver, Canada, Hillary Cooper and Debbie Jacobson. All right, you're from out of the country, it's okay. From the JCC of Greater Washington in Rockville, Maryland, Bradley Stillman. From the JCC of Indianapolis in Indianapolis, in Indiana, Lynn Levy and Rick Weiss. From the JCC of Louisville in Louisville, Kentucky, Jeffrey Tuvlin. From the JCC of Metropolitan Detroit in Detroit, Michigan, Alana Glazier. From the JCC Metro West in West Orange, New Jersey, Sandra Foreman. From the JCC of Northern Virginia in Fairfax, Virginia, Michael Schur. From the Jewish Community Alliance in Jacksonville, Florida, Chase Zimmerman. From the Kaplan JCC on the Palisades in Tenafly, New Jersey, Dana Adler. From the Kaplan JCC on the Palisades in Tenafly, New Jersey, Barry Zeller. From the Leventhal Sidman JCC in Newton, Mass, Philip Schur. From the Mandel JCC in Cleveland, Ohio, Mindy Davidson. From the Mandel JCC in West Hartford, Connecticut, Michael E. Merritt. From the Mandel JCC in West Hartford, Connecticut, Gail Temkin. From the Marcus JCC in Atlanta, Georgia, Michael Dinnerman. From the Marriage JCC of Orange County in Orange County, California, Katie Chase and Ryan Chase. From the Marriage JCC of Orange County in Orange County, California, Adrian Matros, Michael Shane, and Julie Sherman. From the Milton and Betty Katz JCC in Margate, New Jersey, Mark Newman. From the New Orleans JCC in New Orleans, Louisiana, Amy Bain and Debbie Schlackman. From the Osherman Family JCC in Palo Alto, California, Nanette Friedland and Susan Saul. From the Rose and Max Rady JCC in Winnipeg, Canada, Danny Stoller. From the Sampson Family JCC in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Jane Chernoff and Howard Stern. From the Shaw JCC of Akron in Akron, Ohio, Alyssa Hilton. From the Shaw JCC of Akron in Akron, Ohio, Lisa Lumen. 
from the Shimon and Sarah Birnbaum JCC in Bridgewater, New Jersey, Jeff Feinstein and Seth Geldzoller, from the Siegel JCC, from the Siegel JCC in Wilmington, Delaware, Michael Kaplan, from the Siegel JCC in Wilmington, Delaware, Brent Salomon, from the Stanford JCC in Stanford, Connecticut, Brenda Piskin, from the St. Louis JCC in St. Louis, Missouri, Monte Sadler, from the Tucson JCC in Tucson, Arizona, Rebecca Bednar, from the Tucson JCC in Tucson, Arizona, Neil Cash, and from the Weinstein JCC in Richmond, Virginia, Shelley Golden. Mazel tov to you all. Thank you. Well, mazel tov to all the Esther Leah Ridge participants. We look forward to your continued involvement as leaders, both at your local JCCs and on the continental level. It gives me great pleasure now to call on Ron Lebo, a member of the JCC Association Board of Directors and past recipient of the Frank L. Ohio Military Award to make this year's presentation. Ron? Congratulations to all the new leaders. I think it's great to see, and it's important for the future of the Jewish Community Center movement. Keep it going. We're also able today to acknowledge another great Jewish leader, uh, Noreen Gordon Zablatsky, who is the currently the chair of the JCC Association's Committee on Services to the Military. And we honor her today with the Frank L. Weil Award for Services to, the to Jews in the Military. So Noreen, please join me at the podium. You really are. Noreen, Noreen, you really are one of the great leaders in the JCC movement and in the general Jewish community. You've been president of the Dave and Mary Alper JCC in Miami. As a member of this association's board for more than a decade, you served as the chair of the 2008 biennial in Miami and as in other important positions, including the one you currently have as a vice chair of the association and as chair of the finance of the uh, FRD committee. In your leadership as chair of the military side of the house, you've done some very important things and you've brought the JWB portion of our work to, to new heights. You truly have. You recently participated in two days of high-level briefings at the Pentagon on matters of military policy and the support of religious communities in the, in the military. Those briefings were attended by the flag officers from all branches of the United States military, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, as well as the Under Secretary of Defense and the Director of the Armed Forces Chaplaincy Board. You work closely with our JWB chaplains in, uh, in, in leading and providing financial support in developing and effectuating this incredible program we call Torah for, for, Torahs for Our Troops in which we actually uh, have scribed new Torah scrolls and they're, they're written and for use of Jewish military personnel in the field and on our nation's uh, naval ships. To date, four scrolls have been written and presented thanks to the leadership that you've provided in that program. You were successful in your efforts to establish a monument for fallen Jewish chaplains at the Arlington National Cemetery and recently participated in a very moving ceremony dedicating that memorial. But all of this is just a small representation of the great leadership you've provided in the JCC movement and the Jewish community generally. And even that is just a small part of who you are. You're the mother of four, including Shane, a United States Navy veteran. You are close to your family and your friends, some of whom, including your mom, who are with us here today. And most of all is your neshuma. You are a very caring and thoughtful person. You stand tall in recognition 
of your friends and those with whom you toil in Jewish communal life who are deserving of commendation and appreciation for all they do. That's even more important to you than anything else, being sure that those around you are appreciated for what they do. And you act on what you believe. As living as you do in South Florida, you feel a special kinship to the Jews of Cuba. And you were forceful in getting the JCC Association to send a delegation of our leaders to Cuba to meet with and support the Jewish community there. In fact, while you were in Cuba, you led a bit of a revolution of your own, getting contributions, going to the market, pulling together a supply of food, and taking it to a food program at a Havana synagogue. You did it because you cared, and that's who you are. So it is with great pleasure, and it's altogether fitting, that today we honor you with the 2012 Frank L. Weil Award for Distinguished Contribution to the Armed Services Field. It's presented to you today, May 7, 2012, on behalf of the JCC Association, on behalf of the work that we do in the military, and some very grateful friends. Congratulations. I can get the direction on my iPad, right? <laughs> thank you, Ron. I'd also like to thank my mother, Jackie, my sister, Lori, my daughter, Rachel, and my friends, Sheila and Gail, for traveling here to be with me today, not only to support me, but also to try and understand who these people are that I work with and why this organization is so important to me and why I've chosen to dedicate so much time to a common mission with them. I'm very proud and honored to receive the Frank Weil Award for the work that my colleagues and I have contributed towards services to Jews in the military. As is usually the case, little of what lay volunteer leaders do can be accomplished without the vision and the implementation of the professional staff that we work with. And never could this case be more clearly exemplified than by the role retired Rear Admiral Harold Robinson played in my tenure as committee chair. There were many extraordinary things that were accomplished for the young men and women who served in our armed services over the last few years. Aside from the regular tasks of recruiting and endorsing qualified chaplains and making sure that they are distributed in a way to maximize their impact in the field, we distribute Tanakh in the usual Passover and holiday necessities. I was also honored to be there at a very important time when we were instrumental in a lot of extraordinary projects, such as lobbying for and helping to implement the policy that forever changed the don't ask, don't tell era. During During a particular visit to the Pentagon, we were able to secure kosher food on Navy ships for the first time. As we said, we organized the writing and raised funds for four, and then we're gonna do two more, so six total, hopefully, miniature safer Torahs, which went into the field, and we lobbied and helped legislation pass, enabling the planning and the erection of the memorial in Arlington National Cemetery, honoring the chaplains who died in the line of duty. I was so proud and humbled. I was so proud and humbled to be there on the day of its dedication. None of this would have happened without Rabbi Robinson, and I would like to thank him, not only for being a mentor and a friend and for making me buy sneakers and running clothes and chasing him around on his five-mile run one day on Capitol Hill. Now I know why Capitol Hill is called a hill. I never really understood that before but most importantly for his infectious dedication and passion which made the last five years much more meaningful. There's only one thing 
that made me more proud than serving with Rabbi Robinson. I was asked to chair the services to the military committee because my son Shane made the decision to serve our country in the United States Navy. I have to admit that his father and I were a little taken aback by Shane's determination to serve in the Navy. We were the product of the Vietnam era and the, this path that our bright Jewish chemical engineer son was choosing seemed foreign to us. We used to argue over whose fault it was. His, his, his dad used to say that it was my fault for dressing him in a sailor suit when he was six months old <laughs> for, his, for his portrait. And I used to accuse his father, it uh, must have been the many, many military ships that he took Shane on when we were doing our family boating travels. But Shane had vision and determination, and his decision, decision to join the Navy had really been cemented as a result of his participation in the March of the Living when he was 16 years old. This experience and his subsequent visit to Israel brought out his sense of patriotism and responsibility, not only to the Jewish people, but to any people who might need his help in ensuring that their most basic rights to freedom and life were guaranteed. I have no doubt that Shane will look back on his experience in the Navy as being the most formative and influential years of his life. This past summer, after 10 years of service as an officer in the nuclear propulsion program, Shane went on inactive duty after completing his last position as Lieutenant and Chief Operating Officer of the Nuclear Submarine Teaching Program in order to reserve, resume his life as a civilian with his wife, Kate, and his two sons, Sam and Levi. I could not be more proud of him and I'd like to dedicate this award to him today. He would be here, but he's on reserve duty, so. Like many people in uniform here today, Shane said, Hineni, here I am, in a very big way. And I can only hope and pray that a tiny bit of that came from the example I've tried to set for my children. I'm thankful to have been blessed with the resources and the desire to dedicate my time to a lifelong commitment to do my part to help not only the Jewish community in America, but in Israel and around the world as well. To try every day to help ensure that needs are met, education provided, and opportunities presented to people who are not in a position to secure it for themselves and to help create a vision for our Jewish community. Last week, I participated in a mega mission to Israel with 740 people from Miami, the largest delegation that's visited Miami in the last, that visited Israel in the last 10 years. It was an amazing trip, and one that showcased many of the Matnasim or JCCs that our JCCA Israel office works with. One of the highlights was a collaborative dance program between the teens from the Michael Ann Russell JCC in Miami and the JCC in Yerucham, Miami's new P2K partner, and part of our WCJCC's Tri-Center project. I was so very proud of my friend Gary Bomser, the JCC exec from Miami, whose constant attention to the relationships we form with Israel sets an example we should all strive to emulate. At the closing ceremony in Israel, Rabbi Danny Gordis called on each and every one of us to live our lives so that we can look back one day and tell our children that we did the very best that we could for our community in general and for the Jewish people in particular. To ensure that we have a strong Jewish community at home, a strong Israel with a bright and secure future. I'm grateful to the JCCA for recognizing me for the work that I've done with the military these last few years, but I'm even more grateful for them, to them for the opportunity for providing a vehicle through which I can work and fulfill my personal commitment to Tikkun Olam and to do it with such a wonderful group of people who share my passion for the Jewish community here in Israel and around the world. Toda Rabah.
The, the Jewish Military Leadership Award recognizes a military officer of high rank who is active in the Jewish con community. This year, the award will be presented to Rear Admiral Herman A. Shalansky, Commander Carrier Strike Group 10, Admiral Shalansky, please join me. Admiral Shalansky began his naval career when he was commissioned as an ensign in July 1980 and earned his naval flight officer wings in 1982. Admiral Shalansky commanded the Blue Tails on the USS John C. Stenson's maiden deployment around the world. He was awarded the CNO Battle E Award, Safety Award, and the AEW Excellence Award. He commanded and decommissioned the Sixth Fleet's Fighting Command ship, USS LaSalle, and the U.S. Harry S. Truman in the Arabian Gulf. As commander of the Truman, Admiral Shulansky installed an arc and Torah on the ship, and he, was, he has led the effort to supply all aircraft carriers with Torah scrolls. He was selected to study the effect on the military of the repeal, don't ask, don't tell. With great sensitivity, he worked towards transitioning the Navy through this repeal of this policy and to a full acceptance of gay and lesbian sailors. Admiral Shalansky is also active in his local synagogue community. Please join me in congratulating Admiral Herman A. Shalansky on this very special recognition, and I'd like to read what's inscribed on it. The JCC Association presents the Jewish Military Leadership Award to Rear Admiral Herman A. Shalansky, who for 32 years has answered the call to serve God, country, and our people, a true American patriot and faithful son of the Jewish people, in defending our beloved country and maintaining the heritage of his ancestors. He consistently models the highest values and aspirations of the American Jewish community. Admiral Shalansky. Thank you. I'm very honored and humbled to be here today. And I accept this award on behalf of all the military men and women for their patriotism, their love of country, and their willingness to serve and sacrifice for the common good. Today, as we have been since the birth of our nation, we are a seafaring nation that depends on the ocean commerce. But more than that, the oceans are a means to affect our national strategy around the world. To understand the importance of our Navy to protect this trade in our national defense, think 70, 80, 90, 100. Seventy percent of the world is covered by oceans. Eighty percent of the people of the world live near those oceans. Ninety percent of our trade travels on the ocean, and your Navy is on watch 100% of the time to respond to our nation's threats, to influence events in faraway locations, to protect us at home, keep the flow of goods moving, to prevent war, or being able to respond to those events instantly in the air, on the sea, or under the sea. 
To accomplish this in my 32-year Navy career has taken me in travels all over the world with port calls in the Philippines, Japan, Australia, Singapore, Greece, Italy, all in all over 50 countries. In all the seas and oceans of the world, from the 120 degree heat of the Arabian Gulf to the sub-zero temperatures of the Northern Pacific. Visiting ancient synagogues, the oldest in the Americas in Curacao. Exploring the over 2,000 year old mikveh in Syracuse, Italy. Meeting with Jews in the Philippines and praying with those with an Irish brogue in Ireland. Attending an official military service in Israel at Yad Vashem to lay a reef. Sitting Shiva for a Jewish Iraqi family living in Bahrain that needed a minion. Praying at sea every Friday night during nine months of deployment. Eating chicken, which one of the chefs got to hide away when they were serving pork in the mess. Lighting Hanukkah, Hanukkah candles during a hurricane at sea with over 30 foot waves breaking over the bow of the carrier. Hosting a Passover Seder for the whole ship in the Arabian Gulf during a break in the war with hundreds of sailors, Jews and non-Jews alike, attending, and watching the admiral at the time, not Jewish, insisting on drinking all glasses of wine to the last drop. <laughs> this is on a ship where alcohol is not allowed at sea. <laughs> and finally, sailing with a Torah, a Torah from Lithuania, a Torah with, that we pray with today on board our aircraft carrier, the USS Harry S. Truman. It's an ironic twist of fate that this Torah that was supposed to be a symbol for their Nazis and their planned museum for the extinct race of the Jews was raised from the destruction of the Holocaust and today sails for freedom and peace in the world with your Navy. Your fleets, your armies, your air force are manned by men and women that come from all over the 50 states and U.S. territories. They're Caucasian, they're African American, Asian American, Latino or Hispanic, Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, and yes, Jewish. Every service member contributing positively to the mission and the defense of our nation. And they do this many months, sometimes up to a whole year, on multiple deployments, away from their homes, away from their families and their loved ones. You can believe me when I tell you that they all really do earn their pay. And the price has been high. Our nation has been at war now for over 11 years. We have been fighting with an all-volunteer force, a force that represents only 1% of our nation. There's been over 4,400 deaths, 32,000 alone wounded in Iraq, 1,800 dead and over 14,000 wounded from Afghanistan. We're involved in an often brutal encounter with insurgents where we deal on a daily basis with improvised explosive devices that have done serious damage in deaths and wounds and trauma to our service members. And as military service members make the ultimate sacrifice overseas, another kind of sacrifice here at home often gets overlooked, that of the military families. As my wife, Patty, who is with me today, is so happy to remind me, Herm, we joined the Navy because you wanted to, but we stay in the Navy because I let you. <laughs> and as organizations like the JCC that help support our troops, and have the potential to reach out in many venues that can help the men and women that have served our nation. So thank you again for this recognition and what you have done and continue to do for our warfighters in all of our services. Thank you. Yasha Ko to both Noreen Sabotsky and Rear Admiral Solansky on these well-deserved awards. 
I would like to now call upon Paul Barron to introduce our keynote presenter. Paul is the class of 1937 professor of law at Tulane Law School. He has been at Tulane since 1976. Paul teaches commercial law and negotiations and has served as the interim senior vice president for academic affairs and provost as, and as vice president for information technology and CIO. Some of his civic activities include president of Turo Infirmary, Turo Synagogue, and Jewish Family Service. And he sits as a board member of a charter school, a community med uh, mediation program, and a medical center system. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, Paul has also played a role in helping to rebuild Tulane University. Joining us with Paul today is his wife, Arlene, past director of the New Orleans JCC. Paul, the podium is yours. What I wrote was much shorter than what we just heard. Presumably, the point of an introduction is more than, the sim than simply the transition between the prior event and the keynote speaker. Rather, the reason for the introduction is to tell the audience something about the person who is, getting the sp who is g giving the speech. For many speeches, this is achieved by a listing of the speaker's positions, achievements, and awards. I could spend far more than the time I have to provide that impressive list for Scott Cowan. But such a list, as important as it is, does not begin to give you the essence of the man. I am very lucky to have worked for Scott. Everyone at the university simply calls him Scott. To be his colleague, and most importantly, to be his friend. From these perspectives, I know what helps make him tick. Scott has the unique ability to find innovative solutions to very difficult problems for Tulane University, for the city, and the nation. But these ideas die, no matter how good they may be, unless there is a champion to make them happy, happen. For me and everyone else, Scott is a champion. He has been steadfast in ensuring that the university and New Orleans rebuilds. Scott recognized that there was a critical tie between Tulane University and New Orleans and now requires a service learning requirement for graduating at Tulane. In 2009, Scott received the New Orleans Loving Cup Award, recognizing citizens who have worked unselfishly with the community without expectation for public acclamation or material reward. Scott also loves people. As you will see in a minute, Scott has the ability to command a large room, but he also has the ability to connect with, an, with a single individual through a few words or a touch. But his most important trait is his leadership. In the dark times after Katrina, as we wondered if there would be ever a functioning city and whether the university would survive, Scott carried us through. Leadership inspires, cajoles, and understands people. Scott does all of these. With one of his most important advisors, his wife Marjorie, at his side, Scott, in the 14 years he has served as president, he has moved Tulane University 
from a very good university to a great university. I am very proud to present him to you today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Orleans. From the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for having your meeting here in our city. And my thank you is very genuine and heartfelt, because you could have had this meeting anywhere in the United States and beyond, but you chose New Orleans. As I travel the country, as I often do for our city, the one question that inevitably is asked of me after I speak is, what is it we can do for New Orleans six years after Katrina? And I say, come to our city. Bear witness to what has happened here. Let people know in America that New Orleans is well and is thriving and is very hopeful about its future. I can't tell you how many people in America still ask me today, is New Orleans flooded? Will New Orleans ever recover? Does New Orleans still have the same charm and iconic feel to it as it did before Katrina? And I give my answers, but they think I am biased because I live in New Orleans. But you are now here, and you are seeing it for yourself. And I ask each of you, as you go back to your cities across the country, to be ambassadors for New Orleans, to tell people, we are doing well. You should come here, and there's a lot to learn. You can tell, by the way, from my accent that I am not from the South. <laughs> I was born and raised in New Jersey. Now, there are a great deal of similarities between New Jersey and Louisiana. <laughs> I do not have enough time today to go through all those similarities. But there is one difference that's very important, and it's how you greet people. In New Jersey, when you greet a person, you say, how you doing? In New Orleans, you say, how's your mama? So I have learned over the years how to take my New Jersey style and character and fit to fit New Orleans. And I am pleased to be here at this meeting and to talk to you about New Orleans and leadership. I actually want to tell you a story. And it's a story that has three parts to it. Part one is I want to talk about Katrina. I want to talk a little bit about what happened to this city to refresh your memory, in case you had forgotten, of the great disaster that befell this city. The second thing I want to do is to talk about how what happened to this city encouraged, forced Tulane and New Orleans to reimagine their futures. And the third and last part of my story is what are the leadership lessons that came from what happened to New Orleans? I have to say, as I start the story, I'm so proud of the JCC for honoring the military here today. I myself served in the military as an active soldier in the U as a U.S. Army infantryman in the early 1970s, a different time, a different war, but nonetheless, it is that service, quite honestly, that helped me get through Katrina. And without that service, I'm not sure that I would have personally been able to do some of the things that I did. But most of all, I'm so grateful to the military because of the sacrifices they make on behalf of our country and for democracy. So we all them, all, owe them all our respect and our congratulations and their thanks 
So thank you to the military. Now, my uh, clicker does not seem to be clicking in the right direction. Oh. All right. No, nope. we're at the end of the presentation. So now we gotta go all the way to the beginning. I apologize. We're going backwards. Yeah, there we go, thank you. All right, could we get that one up uh, as the front one and we'll see if we can go from there? I start with this particular picture. And the reason I wanted you to see it is this is what a projected Hurricane 5 looks like when it's about ready to hit your city. Now, you don't see New Orleans on this map, and matter of fact, you don't even see the state because we're behind that big white cloud. And it's interesting, by the way, the one of the things about hurricanes, you usually know weeks in advance and days in advance is when it's going to make landfall and where it's going to make landfall. But Katrina really surprised us in New Orleans. Because four days before it made landfall, it did not look like it was coming to New Orleans. It looked like it would be east of us. And we were all saying in New Orleans, we have dodged a bullet. But mysteriously, in the 48 hours, after we thought we had dodged that bullet, it moved west. And this is what we began to see just about a day and a half before it made landfall. This was an interesting time for Tulane University, by the way, because this picture was taken on the Saturday before the storm came, and it came on a Monday. And guess what we were doing that particular Saturday? We were welcoming the brand new entering class to Tulane University. And I remember the convocation as if it was yesterday, because normally I would be dressed in my robes and I would be going out and having a very formal ceremony welcoming everybody to the University of New Orleans. Instead, I gathered all the students and their families together and I was wearing Bermuda shorts and a t-shirt. And I said to them, welcome to Tulane University. We were formed in 1834. We're one of the most univer distinctive universities in America. And by the way, you have to leave for five days. And I said, a storm is coming this way, but if the past is a prelude to the future, you will only be gone five days and then you will come back. I had the five wrong, the days was, I mean, I had the five right, but the days were wrong, because the days turned out to be months. When Hurricane Katrina happened on Monday, I was actually on campus and stayed during the entire storm and evacuated a week later. It was a ex horrific experience to be here during that period of time. There are no words to properly describe what it felt like. When the storm, by the way, passed through, I walked out of the building I was in, and you'd probably be surprised to know that there was no water anywhere. There was no flooding in New Orleans. And I had said, thank goodness there is no flooding. It is over we'll clean up the debris and we'll be back within a week. But we heard on the radio that there had been a breach in a levee. And we didn't quite know what a breach meant in the levee and the consequences of it. But within 48 hours we learned because the vast majority of our city was flooded and that included Tulane University. This is the impact that Hurricane Katrina had on New Orleans. Over 1,800 people lost their lives. Most of the people lost their lives because they died in the floodwaters, died of lack of care, or died of asphyxiation. 400,000 jobs were lost. 275,000 homes were destroyed. And by the way, that is 10 times the number that had ever been destroyed in any other disaster in the United States. The total cost, I have $110 billion. The final bill was $200 billion. 
the costliest storm or tragedy in the history of the United States. I want to show you a map. This is a map of Orleans Parish. And what I want you to notice is what is in red. Red is the flooded part of Orleans Parish. And if you calculated the percentage of the parish that was flooded, it was 80% of the parish flooded for an average of 57 days. By the way, 80% of the land mass of Orleans Parish is the equivalent of seven times the size of Manhattan. So if you wonder what a disaster it was, this begins to give you some perspective. Obviously, the storm had an impact on Tulane, and here are the statistics on Tulane. It flooded 70% of our main campus and our entire Health Sciences Center campus, including our hospital. It resulted in 13,000 students and 8,000 employees dispersed for five months. And we became the first major university in the country since the Civil War to have to close for a semester. And our losses alone were over $650 million. I evacuated six days after the storm. My evacuation involved taking a motorboat, hot wiring a golf cart, stealing a dump truck, and then hailing down a helicopter. I remember, by the way, a week later, I was on the Today Show. And I believe it was Matt Lauer said to me, I am confused. How is it that a university president has the skills to hotwire a golf cart, <laughs> steal a dump truck, and hail down a helicopter? And I said, Matt, first of all, I was not born a university president. But as I said before, I was born and raised in New Jersey. When I arrived in Houston, Texas, after I left Louisiana, for all intensive purposes, Tulane University did not exist. Because we had no idea where our students were, we had no idea who, where our faculty were. Our entire information technology system was lost to us, as was all of our campuses. We had to do some soul searching in those few days. And the soul searching was, do we recommend to our board that perhaps we cannot reopen and we think through that strategy, or can we reopen, and if we can, how would we go about doing it? Well, we made three important decisions in those first few days in Houston. The first decision was to pay every single employee of the university as long as we could. That particular decision, by the way, led us to spending $40 million a month for five months when no money came into the university. People asked us why did we do that, and I said to them, that was the simplest of all the decisions because there is only one definition of a great university, and that is it is populated great by great people. And if you lose those great people, you lose your university. And the second reason we did it was we knew they were suffering. They were going through their own losses and pain, and someone had to stand by and be there for them because no one else at the federal, state, or local government was. The second decision we made was to encourage all the colleges and universities in America to take our students that particular fall for one semester only because they needed a place to go. Higher education was one of my great heroes because 597 colleges and universities in America took students from Tulane University that semester. And the vast majority of those colleges and universities didn't charge them tuition. And when they did, they remitted the tuition back to Tulane. And the third decision was that we were going to open up on January 16, 2006. Now, that was chutzpah. Because we made that decision having absolutely no idea whether, in fact, we could reopen. 
But we felt if we did not put out a ray of hope, what is it that our students and our parents and our employees would think about our future? So we simply announced we will be open January 16th, 2006. And then we went about rebuilding Tulane University. Let me quickly tell you what that involved. First of all, we had to restore our campuses. And remember, there was nobody in New Orleans after that storm. There were no companies to work on the restoration of your campuses. So we brought in a company who specialized in coming into areas after disaster to rebuild Tulane University. They actually lived on tents on our campus. They put in their own generators because there was no power. And we said, you do what you have to do as quickly as you could to physically rebuild Tulane University. And it was very clear to me in October of 05 that, in fact, they were doing a marvelous job, that they were, in fact, remediating our campuses such that we could open up in January of 06. But something else dawned on me in October of that year. We were going to be able to reopen, but the rest of New Orleans was not open for business. And when we came to that reality in October of 05, we said we now have to build the village, a self-contained village, so when we reopen, all the necessities that our people need will be there. The first thing we did, and we would not have been able to do it without Paul Barron, is we were able to convince the school, Lusher School, to reopen not as K through 8, but as K through 12, and to become a charter school. I remember very fondly Paul saying to me, I can get the principal to come to Houston, Texas, Kathy Reilinger. And we got Kathy to come to Texas, and we said, Kathy, we need for you to reopen your school January 16th. And we need it to be K through 12, not K through 8. And by the way, you have to make sure that the children of all our faculty and staff and all the other universities can go to that school. She looked at us and she said, are you kidding me? The school is flooded. We have no books. The school district is closed down. We have no teachers. And our response to her was, these are merely details. <laughs> that school opened January 16, 2006. And it took the children of all the universities here so the universities could reopen and a number of children from the neighborhoods. Kathy Reilinger, Paul Barron, superb examples of leadership and heroes in our community. Well, the next thing we found out after we got our school up and ready is there was no place for anybody to live. Because we did an online survey and people were writing into us and saying, by the way, we'd love to come back, but there is no place. We don't know that our apartment or our home. And I remember one night we were brainstorming about how it is that we could house maybe thousands of people. So we decided to buy an apartment building that was still functioning. We built modular housing. And after we did all that, we had maybe 400 apartment-like opportunities. And one night, one of our physicians got a brilliant idea. He said, you know, a few months ago, I went on a cruise. Why don't we get a cruise ship? So we got a cruise ship. And you know where we got it from? From Israel. And this cruise ship comes down the Mississippi River with the Star of David. And all New Orleans said, my God, the Israelis are attacking New Orleans. I don't think there was a single member of the crew that spoke English. It was only Hebrew. But you know what? They got that ship into the Mississippi River in a slip we gave them, and they were with us for five months.
The next thing we begin to do is we begin to check in with our other universities, Dillard and Xavier and Loyola, to see how they were faring. We were particularly concerned about Dillard because they were in a part of the city that was totally flooded. And they're what we call an historically black college and university. And we had read in the newspaper that they were going to move to Atlanta, Georgia. Now you remember Dillard University had been in this community for over 100 years and we're reading they're going to move to Atlanta, Georgia permanently. The other thing that caught us as very sad was since it was an African-American institution, at the very time that African-Americans were being ravished here in New Orleans, we were going to have one of our most prominent institutions move. I reached out to the president of Dillard, who had only been in her job six weeks. But here is the great irony. Marveline, before coming to Dillard, was president of one of the state institutions in California. And when she came to New Orleans, someone asked her, why did you leave California to come here? And she said, I was sick of earthquakes. <laughs> True story. So welcome to the South and hurricanes. We were able, Tulane was able to form a bond with them. And we said to Tulane, uh, to Dillard University, if you stay here, we will provide you space. Your students can take our courses at the university, just as others around the country were helping us earlier that fall. And I'm proud to say that Dillard University is not only here, they're thriving. We had to go out and re-recruit all of our students in America. And even though those colleges and universities had promised that they wouldn't take our students, <laughs> some were not you know, quite as scrupulous as they should be. By the way, a shout out to Brandeis, they were wonderful. <laughs> so we went all over America and we re-recruited them. And you know what we found out? It wasn't our students that were the problem, it was their parents. So we mounted a hall program. And it was interesting because everybody in America predicted we'd be lucky if we could get 50% of our undergraduates back. But when we opened on January 16, 2006, 87% of them came back. <laughs> After the storm, there was no health care in New Orleans. The hospitals were all closed. So that was our next problem was how in the world do we take care of health care? And I was deeply concerned about this. And one day I got a call from one of our physicians, Karen DeSalvo. And Karen says, I'd like to open up a clinic downtown on Poydras, right near Harris. A clinic to serve people in the city. I said, Karen, I don't understand. First of all, there's nobody in the city. We, there's no buildings down there. There's no power down there. How are you going to do this? She said, I want you to come down and see it. So this is only two weeks after the storm. I go down to Harris. You'll see it if you haven't seen Harris. And I go on the street corner, and what do I see? A large cardboard box. And it says, Tulane Health Clinic. <laughs> but you know what else I saw? 60 patients lined up for health care and doctors and residents and nurses delivering health care right then. And from that moment, from that one clinic, Karen DeSalvo became the spokesperson, the catalyst to building an entire network of community health clinics in New Orleans, long before the hospitals got rebuilt. Do you know how many of such clinics exist today? Ninety-three. And the last thing we did was we started rolling up our sleeves and helping the city. Because we are the largest private employer in Orleans Parish, we have a lot of intellectual capital, a lot of human talent, and I'll tell you more about rolling up our sleeves. Well, that's a quick story of Katrina. Now let me tell you how it led to the reimagination of Tulane. 
because we knew in the fall of 05 we could not come back as the same institution we were before Katrina. It simply wasn't possible. So we began to do some real soul searching as an institution, and we asked ourselves a very simple question that I always ask every organization to think about. What is your moral compass? Why do you exist? If you weren't in existence, how would people suffer? That's a fundamental question for every organization and for every leader, and we had to ask ourselves that. And even though we are an outstanding university, there are lots of outstanding universities in America. So what difference would it make if one of them went away? And we went back to the basic mission of the university, and we said our mission is about research, it's about education, and it's about community engagement. And we looked at that mission and we said, why is this mission important, and it isn't the right mission for the institution? And the question that stood out for us was, was community engagement. When we were really honest with ourselves and we looked in the mirrors, what we said is, we're really about research and education. And by the way, through our research and education, we're delivering very important things for the advancement of society. And that, in essence, constitutes our community engagement plus our volunteerism. But we dug deeper into the community engagement, and what we said we needed to do was to better connect education and research with community engagement at the ground level. Starting with New Orleans and using our experience from New Orleans to improve New Orleans, but then spread out from New Orleans to all over the world wherever there is a disaster. That was an epiphany for us. Perhaps we should have thought about that before, Katrina, but we didn't. It was an epiphany. And what has happened over the last six years is we have developed a vision, and I want to just read this vision to you, if I can. And we call, by the way, our initiative Tulane Empowers. Tulane will be the leading research university to mobilize its expertise to build stronger and healthier communities and to develop the next generation of engaged citizens and leaders. There's a few words I want you to focus in this vision. We desire to be the leading institution, not a institution or an N institution. And we're going to be very community focused and help communities, as I said, locally and around the globe. But what it's all about is developing the next generation of engaged citizens and leaders. Because if there's something that our country needs and the world needs, is more engaged citizens and more leaders. And we're going to create more opportunities for them in addition to getting the classical education in the classroom to develop the softer skills, which we call emotional intelligence, and getting things done at the ground level. Let me tell you the six areas we're focusing on, and I won't go through each of these, but I want to take out a couple. The first one is service. You see it at the bottom there. After Katrina, Tulane University became the first and only major research university in the country that integrates public service into the core curriculum all four years students are here. All four years. In the last five years, our students have expended 750,000 hours rebuilding New Orleans alone. And you can't imagine how creative they've been. I'm going to give you two simple examples. One is something called the Grow Dat Farm. I can tell I don't have a lot of New Orleans Saints fans here. Because we're the Who Dat Nation, so we did Grow Dat. Um, all right. <laughs> the students got this idea that we needed to build an urban farm. And the reason we needed to build an urban farm is the first thing is, we needed to improve the nutrition of people who live in New Orleans because we have the highest obesity rates of any city 
in the United States. The second thing is that we felt that it would be a great tra training ground for at-risk children in the public school system. So the students in the School of Architecture designed the farm, including the buildings. The next semester, they built it themselves. And then the students gathered and developed the programs to bring at-risk children into work the farms and to teach them life skills. 60% of the produce, by the way, from that farm is sold to local restaurants in the area, and the other 40% is donated to all the poverty centers in New Orleans. A second idea was something called Aristotle in the schools. We had a group of philosophy majors, and they were trying to figure out how to make a difference. And we said, you're creative, think about it. So they decided to set up a network of debate clubs in the middle schools throughout New Orleans. And in three years, they have set up a very robust set of clubs that are now competing on a regional and national ba basis in debate. Phenomenal success. The other one I want to mention is youth development, especially K through 12. We put a lot of time and energy in K through 12 education because we think the future of our city and our country is predicated on K through 12. If we don't get that right, nothing else is going to matter in the United States because all the problems we have, whether it's crime, blighted neighborhoods, uh, obesity, poor health outcomes are all related to a population that is not well educated. We started it by, right after the storm, I headed up the community-wide effort to develop a new vision and plan for public education in New Orleans. There were hundreds of people involved in that process. And that plan is now being implemented, and it's predicated on decentralizing public education down the, to the school level through charter schools. Today, by the way, 80% of the children in New Orleans go to a charter school. That's the highest percentage in the United States. But what you also should know, which is much more important, before the storm, 67% of our schools were failing. Today, it's 16%. And now children, regardless of their zip code in America, now feel they have hope, and so does our city. The last one is this notion of social innovation, because when it all gets down to the future is about our ability to innovate and to implement. And we now have set up an entire apparatus at the university to promote social innovation, everything from prizes to courses to a new major, interdisciplinary major in social innovation. And I'm proud that over the last six years, Tulane University has won every national award a university can win for community engagement. That is the reimagined Tulane. Now let me tell you what impact it had on us. First of all, it better positioned us for the future. And we have an all-time high in student interest and quality. Three years ago, we had more applications to Tulane University than any other private university in America. If you look at the quality of our student body on paper, it is phenomenal. But most of all, it's the character and values. We now have a culture of civic in in engagement and social innovation that is throughout the university, shared by faculty, staff, and students. And as a result, faculty retention and hiring is going extremely well. We've gotten a lot of proactive national reputation because of what we've done. Our partnerships with other universities are thriving. And our relationship with New Orleans and the state are as good as they've ever been. 
It's sad to say <clears throat> that New Orleans today and Tulane are stronger and better than they ever would have been if Katrina hadn't happened. It's a sad thing to say. Because I don't know that we would have had the courage and the leadership and the foresight and the determination to do what we did if it hadn't been for that. Our critics, by the way, tell us, well, you took the opportunity. What we said was we had a responsibility. We had a responsibility to build a better and stronger neighborhood because if we didn't do it, who was going to do it? We had to do it in the name and honor of those people who suffered so much and to make sure it never happened again. And we're proud of what we've done, and we don't declare victory yet, but the work in progress is one that satisfies us. Now, what did we learn from all of this? What are the takeaways that I'd like to share with you? The first one almost sounds trite, do the right thing. And you know, someone asked me once a question, would you have done this if it weren't for Katrina? And I had to say no. And they said, well, then you weren't doing the right thing. And I had to say, you're right. And as I've talked to some of the most superb leaders that I have found in the country, one of them sitting in the front row, Mort Mandel. That is their mantra, do the right thing. That's what's expedient, not what is politically correct, not is that what is going to make you the favorite with anybody. It is the right thing as you see it. The second thing is <clears throat> extraordinary leaders have tremendous resilience, tremendous resilience. In New Orleans, we've learned about resilience. And I remember after the storm, I began to do some research on the word of resilience and see if there had been any research on it. And in fact, there's a whole body of literature about the concept of resilience. And you know where most of that body of literature came from? People who studied the Holocaust and survivors of the Holocaust. And I'm going to oversimplify a complex set of findings that have come out of that literature, but it has said this. The most resilient people share three characteristics. The first is they have an uncanny ability to understand reality, what is actually going on around them. They don't kid themselves by pretending things are different than what they really are. The second character is they have this unbelievable ability to improvise, to be creative, to innovate, to think out of the box of how to take care of problems that others would say are not solvable. And the third characteristic is they have core convictions that guide them to getting to the right thing. A few years ago, I spoke at Central Synagogue in New York. And I was asked the question, what is it about my background that helped me get through Katrina? And I said, that's simple. One is serving as a US military infantry officer. Two, being a student athlete in college. And three, and most importantly, being a Jew. Because we have the principles and the precepts of the Kum Alam, repairing the world. And in the darkest hours, that's all I could remember as I was going forward. And each of us have to look into our own souls and hearts and say to ourselves, do we have the capabilities when the time is called to do the right thing? The third lesson we learned is, in difficult times, especially times of conflict, people tend to get aggressive and adversarial. And that is when times leaders come in and diffuse it, to bring people together and not to split them apart. This is a particular leadership lesson that Ray Nagin, who was our mayor at the time in New Orleans, never learned. 
because he used the opportunity to divide our community by race rather than bringing them together. And I learned that lesson by watching him and others. The ability to build bridges, to diffuse. Fourth thing is, nobody will do anything you ever tell them just because you told them. But if you have data, if you've done analysis, if you've done your homework, you can influence them. I saw that firsthand when we tried to change the public school system. Do you know that the public school system at the time of Katrina, right before it, was the 97th worst public school system of the 100 largest in America? That we had gone through eight superintendents in 10 years? That the FBI had the school board under investigation? And there was no change, because people didn't want change. But after Katrina, as we were going through developing our vision and plan, we put data in front of them about what others were doing in America and having success, and ask ourselves, why aren't we doing these things? And it was that data in the end that was persuasive. Embrace partnerships. You know, no organization that I know of is strong enough and capable enough to move mountains and change the course of a community by themselves. In our particular case, the higher education community is the one that helped us, but we forged new partnerships in our city and in the state to move forward. Doing it alone is not the right strategy for leadership, it's doing it together. For the last two years, I've been serving at the pleasure of Pro President Obama on something called the White House Council for Community Solutions. And our task is just about done. But what he asked us to do was to develop concepts and ideas about how to find community-based solutions to the most difficult problems we have in America. Because he believes it's not the federal government that should be dictating those solutions, it should be at the local level. And at the, the heart of it is partnerships. The sixth is display emotional intelligence. You've all, always heard the story, all the great leaders were C students in college. And I wouldn't advocate that anyone be a C student thinking that will make them a great leader. <laughs> but what you do know is they do have emotional intelligence. The ability to put themselves in the shoes of others, to listen, to be able to reach out and to embrace and to hug someone. The softer skills that exceptional leaders need to move the needle when it comes to difficult problems. Seed the stage. You know, the concept of leadership is almost mythic. Show us the one great person and he or she will lead the way. But that's not the way it happens. That leader can set the tone, the direction, the motivation, the inspiration. But they occasionally have to step back and let others. Great leaders are also great followers at the right time. And that ability to know when to lead and when to step back and let others step in is so critical. Set high expectations. Mort Mundell taught me that. Working with him for about 15 years, as a director of his company, I would sit in awe about how we would set high expectations. And we'd say, Mort, there's no way you can achieve these expectations. He said, but imagine what you could accomplish in the tribe. We were roundly criticized for this when we set out the expectations for the public schools. Because they, people thought we were being too ambitious. But what we have found is high expectations inspire and motivate, but you have to be there to help people achieve them. Number 10 is something I actually coined myself and has become stated in the literature. Hope is not a plan. Now the reason I remember saying that one day is, we were in a meeting in Houston, Paul may remember it, <clears throat> and everybody was standing around saying, well, geez, I hope FEMA comes in and does this. I hope somebody else does this. And I said, if we're sitting around waiting for all these people, we are, 
excuse the expression, dead in the water. We have to create a situation where people feel hope, but we control what we control, and we go forward with it. Unfortunately, the city of New Orleans, for quite a while, was just sitting around waiting for others to help them. The federal government disappointed us. The state government disappointed us. And we suffered as a city longer than we should have because of that lack of support. But you know, in the end, what developed in New Orleans now? A very strong civil society where we don't wait around for anybody anymore. We just roll up our sleeves and get problems solved. The lesson of focus and discipline. One of the mo characteristics that I've seen in many leaders is their ability to zero in on what is the goal and almost take everything else out of sight and not get distracted with things that are not important. And that's hard because all of us have so many constituencies out there that want something from us. And many of those expectations of the different constituencies are actually in conflict with one another. So the ability to sort out what really should be the goal versus other things that can be secondary is important. And then the last one is have the determination to succeed. In the end, and you all know this, leadership is about getting results. It's not about the effort, it's about the results. The road is littered with people who had good effort but didn't get the results. Each and every one of you in this audience is a leader, either because you lead an organization at JCC or you're exempting, exemplifying leadership as an individual because everybody can exemplify leadership by what they do, what they, how they act, and what they support. And this determination to succeed and to never give up is at the heart and the core of leadership. I use my Katrina story because I would not put myself out as a great leader. I would put myself as one who has observed and worked with great leaders. And through the process of osmosis, hoping I'm getting better over time, and to the extent that I can share my experiences with others. But what I know is this, whether it's the JCC world, whether it's the political arena, or whether it's the corporal world, there is a shortage of great leadership. And if you don't do it, who's going to do it? If each one of us doesn't do it, nobody will do it. And if each of us makes that dedication, to uncompromised principal leadership, imagine what we can achieve together, locally, for our country, and around the world. Thank you very much. Now, as I understand that I have a few minutes where uh, I can answer your questions if you have them. I don't know if there's microphones or not. Uh, but if anybody wants to get up and shout out a question, I'll be glad to try to answer it. Or otherwise, if I'm standing between you and Emil, and we're in New Orleans, I know what your preference should be. But is there any out there? I can't see if there's any micro. Oh, I can see the microphones. As the parent of two Tulane uh, students, <laughs> one an alumni who was part of that first class that came back after Katrina, I just want to thank you and let everybody know and attest to the fact that all you've done uh, over this time. I remember being here in uh, 
I guess, April uh, of her senior year in high school, and we came, and the remarkable change from that point that we've witnessed over the last six years has just been amazing, and you know, you're one of the main uh, reasons for that, and I just wanted to say thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for a very inspiring presentation. I'm wondering if you've given any consideration to running for elected office. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Next. <laughs> well, this is the way I like it. All nice things said at the end. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Cowan, thank you for your presentation. We salute your extra, extraordinary leadership at Tulane and for your contributions to the rebirth of New Orleans communities. You're an inspiration for all of us how we can work better as leaders within our own communities. Well, before we move on to announcements, it's time to see the results of yesterday's biennial question. If you remember, we asked you about the changing nature of JCC membership and the Jewish community and whether JCCs should allow anyone to serve on their board to be officers, restrict lay leadership to the Jewish members only, restrict positions on board to people who have traveled to Israel, or restrict officers to people who contribute to the local federation. We had close to 200 respondents weigh in yesterday, and the results are in. The majority of you, 57% of biennial delegates, want to expand opportunities for leadership roles outside the traditional Jewish community to people of diverse backgrounds and faiths. This really represents a large shift in thought and is worthy of further discussion. Thank you for weighing in on those. Now, today's biennial question is, the most important thing JCCs can do to strengthen Jewish life is provide religious educational programming on Jewish holidays, be aggressive outreach to interfaith families, provide more youth-oriented Jewish learning opportunities, and strengthen JCC member relationships to Israel. Now remember, please, to go to your biennial app, guidebook, and choose Monday's biennial question to voice your opinion. Shh. Or you can stop by the registration desk to cast your vote. We'll have the results for you tomorrow. And now for a few announcements. You may all be wondering what those beads were that were placed on your chair earlier. As you've heard, the JWB owns 60 Torahs, which are on loan at major military installations around the world. But chaplains in the field and aboard ships need more portable Torah scrolls that they can carry as they move around the combat theater. So JWB commissioned the writing of small, lightweight, and fully kosher Torah scrolls. Writing even a single letter in those scrolls fulfills an important mitzvah of helping to write a Torah. The scribe will be here through Tuesday morning, and we hope that many of you take this opportunity to inscribe or dedicate a letter, a word, or even a portion or a full book in support of this project. The scribe will be located in the vendor area, Versailles Ballroom, booth 603. This evening, we will be having our biennial bonanza from 5 to 6.30. Each vendor is raffling a gift, and the prizes range from gift cards or gift baskets to iPod shuffles or a Kindle Fire. All you have to do to get a raffle ticket is meet up at, with each vendor, write your name on a ticket, drop it in their bag, and show up this afternoon ready to party. You must be present to win. There will also be a meet and greet and photo op with special guests, Olympic gold medalist Lenny Kraselberg and subway spokesman Jared Fogel. I don't think he's giving out sandwiches, though. <laughs> Israeli NBA player Omni Caspi was unable to join us as he returned to Israel to have surgery on his hand. Join us for durs and soft drinks. A cash bar will be available. And don't forget to visit both of the vendor rooms. Dinner will be on your own this evening. Tomorrow we begin our plenary sessions at 8.30 a.m. with Jared Fogo of Subway fame and Rabbi Daniel Hartman. Then that afternoon we'll have a buffet lunch and learning sessions immediately following. And there's table seating inside the vendor area. Now those of you who have pre-registered for the service project, those of you in the blue shirts, will be leaving from the second side door in the lobby, and we'll have box lunches for you on the bus. 
Please head over there now, and everyone have a great day, and we'll see you at the Bonanza.